Hi, I'm Susan Cranston, and I'm the host of Authentic You, a talk show that features real people in our community who've made transitions in their life and sometimes in their career to follow a more authentic path. And that authentic path often leads them on a journey of new beginnings. I don't know about you, but I've certainly come across people in their life who have been doing what they've loved and doing what they enjoy for most of their life. And in some cases, they just decide to make a transition from perhaps working in a corporate environment or a community setting to focusing on an area where they can do what they love, be their own boss, and be an entrepreneur. I'm really delighted today because our guest is Tom Nunn, and Tom has been following his passion, playing to his strengths, and leading an authentic life for his entire career. Many of you may even know him for his involvement with the record and in other areas of, the, of public relations, media relations, and his community strategies. I've had the privilege of working with Tom in a corporate setting and have always been very impressed with his strategic focus and his many connections in our community. So it was an absolute delight when he agreed to be on the show today and to be able to talk to him about the transition he made from corporate Tom to entrepreneurial Tom. Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Susan. So there have been so many changes that have happened for you in the last few years, and I've watched in wonder and delight and just have been absolutely thrilled for what you've been going through in terms of making a change. Can you tell us a bit about what it's been like to make that transition? It's been a really quite a great transition for me because I was in uh, the corporate world for 12 years, and I was in the media for 20 years before that. And uh, really, I decided that uh, it was time for me to, to make a move and become my own boss. Because the biggest change for me has not been what I'm doing technically day to day. It's the same thing, but I'm actually doing it under my own control. That has been a very positive thing for me. I wouldn't recommend it for everyone, but, I, but there's been a 30-year buildup to this. I actually studied it at least for three years and thought about it, planned it out before I made that jump off the cliff, so to speak. So it was quite a, quite a big thing and love it, loving it. It's, it was a, a lot easier for me, I think, because I did wait and planned it out very carefully, studied what I was going into, and then was ready to go as soon as I hit the ground. And uh, that was f that's exactly how it felt. I hit the ground running. You did hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. And you have so many connections and so many people that you know and so much experience. But you said it wasn't for everyone. So I want to drill down a little bit on that. So there probably were some challenging times or some things that you would say um, that y perhaps you wish you would have known before you ventured out into this. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I knew this was coming, but I think every entrepreneur, everyone who makes the jump out on their own runs into this shock. There's not a regular paycheck every second week. It just sort of, you know, <laughs> disappears. But you don't have a money and tree well, in the backyard? You know, the good, I mean, the good thing about waiting is, I mean, at least financially, I'm, I know what I'm at. My, our boys are all, you know, they've gone through university, college. They're all off running their own careers and, and have their own lives going. So the house is a lot emptier. I could take over a bedroom and create, create a home office, that kind of thing. But, you know, less obligation. Uh, we made sure that they were on their feet before I decided to take my leap. And uh, the interesting thing, too, is my wife had made a similar move. She'd been a lab technologist in hospitals her entire career working for hospitals. About five years ago, just as Grand River and St. Mary's were about to merge the labs, she was hired as a consultant for hospitals across North America, wow. working out of our house. So she was set up in the attic for a few years before I made my move. So she was leading the way she for you. She was leading the way, saying to me, you could do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, uh, she's absolutely right the more I looked at it. So it was, it was a very interesting move. Um, and really, I think it's been a successful move for me because of that background. Uh, you mentioned all the contacts. Uh, it's interesting. The record was actually newspaper number five for me. And the smartest thing I ever did was to start as a journalist in 1978, tracking everyone I was talking to. Hardly anybody does that in journalism. They just, I mean, they, it's, I'm at the far end of the spectrum, right, where, where I would actually, uh, if I was interviewing somebody by phone, whatever, I would actually write that down, stick it on a file card, and continue to build that network. And that's a trick I picked up from my father, who was in real estate and insurance, and he used to say to me, it doesn't matter what you do, it's people. And that stuck with me. As, and I thought about newspapers as I'm going through Western and getting a history degree and all this. What can I do that's different? So, you know, you write stories for newspapers, you for the media, whatever type of media it is, you're doing the stories, but it's really about people. And I thought, if I'm actually growing that network as I go, that becomes valuable unto itself. So, just going ahead 30 years, I realize now that was a very smart thing to do. So, growing that network, 
you think about the changes that have taken place over time mm -hmm. in terms of media and social media. And that's one of the areas that's obviously a passion of mine as well, but I've watched how you've excelled in terms of your use of lever leveraging social media, not only to bring attention to different events or people in the community, but also to help establish your brand in this space. How has that helped you with contacts? It has changed everything dramatically because when I moved, literally the day I changed my title and created my, put my company name out there, I had clients. One of them, someone I hadn't talked to since 1984. And if you think about something like LinkedIn, um, that automatically telegraphed everyone I'm connected with that I'd made a change. And a certain number of them were quite curious. So immediately that day, they send me messages and away we go. We jumped on Skype and one person and I, we j one contact said, uh, this fellow I hadn't seen since 1984 when I left Saskatchewan um, and came to back to Ontario contacted me and said, uh, let's jump on Skype. We had a half hour conversation and next thing you know, he was a client. And that was crazy. He would have never known in the past that I'd done anything unless I called him or he heard it through the grapevine. But this is much more powerful than a grapevine. Right, it's immediate, right? It's, it's immediate, it, it telegraphs what you're doing. It keeps you in contact with those people. And um, it, it just is a great tool. It's Good. one of those things that really helps out. We're going to talk a bit more about that and a lot of other things relating to some advice and tips you have for people who are moving from one role to another and particularly looking at becoming a small business owner or an entrepreneur. Stay with us and we'll be right back with Tom Nunn. Hi, and welcome back to Authentic You, a talk show that features real people in our community who've made transitions in their life and their career to follow a more authentic path. I was just speaking with Tom Nunn, who is our guest today. He's a PR and communication strategist, and we were talking about social media and how that's changed the game of communicating and media significantly. It's probably been a game changer. Tom, can you tell us a little bit more about what that means to you in terms of your business and your value proposition, how you describe what you do? Well, what I do to start with is really focus on, for different clients, how to raise their profile, how to tell their stories, how to get things out there. And the also the other side of media, which is also issues management and the negative side when, when some bad things may happen to people right out of the blue. Uh, my background was as an in the media was as an investigative journalist, a business reporter. So I was, as a writer, covering very positive stories, things like the arrival of Toyota, the expansion of various companies, the, the new tech startups in this area, a lot of those kind of stories. But on the other side of things, news by definition can often be the negative stuff that happened overnight, right? So mm -hmm. you'll see everything from you know plant fires and different incidents at, the, at, at various locations to stock frauds, uh, white collar crime, that kind of thing. So I would be writing those kinds of stories too. In, in the current environment, in my current job, I'd be helping people deal with that. And my c current clients are tech, finance, commercial real estate. Some of them are here, some in Toronto, some are out west. And they come to me really looking for advice on how to deal with things. Now social media has had a massive impact because of the speed of things. I mean literally, all it takes is one person with a guitar that's smashed by, say, United Airlines, Airlines. <laughs> and then suddenly it's all over YouTube, right? So how do they deal with that? And a lot of companies, when that starts to happen, are far too slow. They just don't react quickly enough. They don't realize that social media has already blown them out of the water, and that makes them hide even further. So uh, United was a great case where you know, social media was just all over them simply because of a single video that a guy produced after his guitar was smashed. Well, so he did get retribution, though, yes, in the absolutely, end. And yes. probably got some 15 minutes of fame as a result of that. But that, that case and many others show just how quickly things can, can speed out of control for literally any company. So th that's, that's something that I think uh, the entire media world is dealing with, whether it's the newsrooms themselves are dealing with just the speed and functions and how do they communicate with the growth of the web and how big it is. So tell me a little bit more about reputation. And we know that you, you've just made the comment that in many cases businesses are a bit slower to react or slower to respond because they aren't 
is quite perhaps as prepared for the viral speed, or the lightning speed that social media can have on reputation. What is reputation? Why is it important? Well, I think on a personal level, we all know that, that really when it comes to, say, getting a job, your reputation is vital. It can make the difference between getting a job or getting hired in certain locations or whatever and not getting it. Just that ability to have somebody speak to your strengths. In the corporate world, it's massive because it can touch literally anyone, any audience. So if you take a company like, let's say, BP that had the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, suddenly something happens and it can affect their entire future of the company, whether it's the sales, it can can just spin out of control. Uh, BP is another great case because, you know, it's bad enough having the incident on the Gulf, having millions of barrels of oil in the Gulf, but when your CEO is caught on camera saying, I'd like my life back, and telegraphing to the world that it's all about BP and not the people who've been affected or the, the wildlife that's being destroyed, that's a very major reputational exposure. So there's a mistake there. Huge there's mistake. been a major mistake yes. at a very senior level in an organization. Mm -hmm. There are probably many mistakes that people made, pitfalls so that could be avoided. Can you talk to us a little bit about what those are? Well, the wildest ones are the self-inflicted ones. Uh, the BP one is a glaring one that I use in media training sessions with executives to show them how quickly it happens if they don't think and prepare. I've seen other cases. There's a great celebrated case out of Alberta where the Alberta head of Alberta Health Services was being chased down by reporters, and they call these scrums where reporters are just trying to get answers to questions. And he literally tells them he's eating his cookie repeatedly. Leave me alone, I'm eating my cookie. cookie. I'm eating my cookie. I'm eating my cookie. Well, that cost him his job just days later. He could have more time to eat his cookie. And really, what would have been the pain to stop for five minutes and answer a couple questions? Instead, he, he I mean, maybe he w did have low blood sugar or whatever, but, but still you can see where a simple incident like that and not being prepared for it or ready to deal with the public can backfire dramatically. So a lot, of, a lot of what I do is try to guide people through that, especially on the negative side. Uh, the positive side of things is uh, quite different where we're just looking to get stories out and try to, to build the profile. Of some are small companies, startups in the area. Others are major companies that have uh, international profiles. So it's an interesting territory. So if you, could, if you only had to a minute or two to describe to someone, you know, things that they should absolutely avoid, even as a novice, not a CEO or someone who is a, the head of a, an organization, what would be two or three things that you would say, whatever you do, avoid this? Whatever they, they need to do, they need to avoid going out there without practicing. They actually need to think about what they're saying before they go out there. Um, one of the things I talk about in media training is I say to them, uh, listen, if you were an athlete, if you were a musician, if you were an actor, if you were literally anybody, you would practice. But for some reason, when you sit down with a reporter, you think you're having a single conversation with one person. It may reach billions of people, and you should think about that before you go out there and have that conversation. Wonderful. Thank you for that. We're going to take another quick break, and when we come back, Tom's going to tell us things that you can do to help your brand, to help your reputation, and to share your message. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Authentic You. I'm your host, Susan Cranston, and Tom Nunn, who's a PR and communication strategist, is with me, and we were just talking about common mistakes that people make in the media and how that can negatively affect their reputation. But what I'm going to ask Tom about now is what positive things you can do to create a media blitz, to create awareness, particularly for companies who are starting up, or someone who's starting up as an entrepreneur. What advice would you have for them? How would you create that kind of positive brand? Well, they have to think about a number of things, just ways to get the word out, not only to their own connections and their own network, which is where social media is great, but also how to get it into mainstream media. If you want to look at uh, newspapers, radio, TV, there are different things that they should focus on and ways they can reach out and tell their story. I mean, the first thing I, I think every one before they even decide to become an entrepreneur is to think about that story. What's unique about it? If it's not unique, your business may totally fail anyway. So you need to really think about that story long before you start telling it. Um, but then by the time they get established and out the door, that's when they can actually spend some more time in refining their key messages. Whether, I mean, when I say key messages, why do they exist? What's their business doing? Uh, why is it important that somebody come to them? 
in my case, I had to do the same thing. I spent three years actually before I made this move, which to me seemed like forever. But uh, because I like to do things quickly. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I actually thought about you know, everybody can write. I mean, that in theory, that's no, the biggest... No, they can't. Well, <laughs> not everyone can write, but I'm basically generalizing <laughs> that. I know what you mean. On the surface, it looks like everyone can write, and a lot of people who are in public affairs and, and journalism are great writers. So what makes me different? And so I had to think about that. For some time, I thought, well, what sets me apart? Well, I'm focused on all kinds of... Uh, I have the double background of PR and journalism. Uh, but as a business reporter for 17 of the 20 years, I was an investigative reporter. I know what reporters can do, good, bad, and ugly. Uh, I've had to do some of that. So that's where I can help out uh, some major clients figure that out before they walk into a wall, right? <laughs> because uh, I've actually been involved in stories where, you know, at, that's been the agenda. You know, you're looking at it as something and trying to develop it that way. So getting back to the startup question and those initial steps, News releases, interviews, telling their story to the media, and opening those doors are crucial. A news release can go around the globe very quickly. I had one client here in town where uh, you know, they went from doing their work very quietly under the radar to having their news release on 18,000 websites. Wow. And then the Canadian press picked up the story and it appeared in newspapers coast to coast in Canada. So suddenly overnight, they were known. And they were known by not just the average readers who are reading newspapers, but by their investors, potential clients, and that opened up some business for them. And that is the power of what a good good story and a good campaign can do. Uh, whether it's events, they could, could set up events and, and have various types of campaigns. I've been involved in some of that in my previous yes. job. And um, that's another whole realm that they can look at. So there's something that you said about the time that you took to prepare for this and also trying to create a distinction or something that separates you. And recently I heard this term in media and I think it was um, Seth Godin who talked about uh, being a purple cow right. and what that means. And can you talk a little bit about what that means to be a purple cow and maybe what some of the pitfalls are if you become too out there and how that can affect your brand? Well, in my case, the, the purple cow element in my case is I am very out there in the sense of having that kind of dual background. Uh, my previous corporate job was coast to coast for 12 years, dealing with all the media from the Globe and Mail and CBC on down to the smallest weeklies in Canada and radio stations. And, and that's something quite unique. Uh, another thing Seth said that I thought was brilliant, he said, go out and make a ruckus, make art, do something important. And that really resonated with me as well, because it's not only standing out, but also having that drive to have an impact. But knowing that. And knowing that you can have and an impact. And knowing that you can. Yes, and so a, a lot of what I, I look at, and, and as a journalist, some of the, the best uh, things I'm really proud of was being able to do the kind of complex stories along the way that, that had to be done. I, I mean, in Saskatchewan, I was the team leader on the Colin Thatcher murder case uh, with 10 reporters reporting to me every day and guiding them through a very treacherous story. Then I was hired by the Canadian press, but in Toronto decided to come to Kitchener-Waterloo for all the right reasons. Best move I ever made, I think, <laughs> coming to Kitchener-Waterloo. Uh, you know, I looked at it and I thought, 10 minutes to work, cost living, lifestyle, great universities, great college, what better great place community. to raise a, 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 family. a family. And now all of our boys are in their mid-20s and they have great careers and two Laurier grads, a Conestoga Yay. grad. <laughs> But uh, came here and was thrown into the deep end as the senior business reporter, covering everything that moved. And the uh, last story I did before I moved into my corporate job was the Albert Walker case, which, you know, I, he disappears, leave wa leaves Ontario and disappears forever, it seemed. And a uh, very complex investigation. And uh, those kind of things, to be even exposed to that, uh, let alone front and center, and it was pretty pretty crazy at the time and not always fun, but it was, it was a very great experience. I think something I'll never forget. So with that experience and you say you, you know, you know what you can do to perhaps help people have success in this arena and given your background in journalism too, what do you think y if you were giving advice to someone to say, you're trying to get out there, you're trying to be a purple cow, you're trying to get your, your message heard and there's so much noise right now. There are so many different ways to communicate and social media plays a big part in that, right? There's so many channels now. When we were growing up, it was a, it, there weren't nearly as many options or distractions. So how do you suggest 
people can help the media or help journalists in terms of making sure that they're providing them with the information they need to share that message. The first question they need to ask themselves, is this really news? Is this something that the rest of the world really cares about? Uh, and I think everybody needs to do that before they, s they start going out telling a story because the first lesson everyone needs to get through their, through their brain before they, they make a move out there and approach the media is why would the media care? I mean, the media is very busy. I mean, every day there are hundreds of news releases that go out. So you're threading the eye of a needle before you even get started. So you have to make, sh make a very compelling story and make sure you're not just going out there expecting to write it. Uh, stepping back and looking at media generally, they're not there to just tell your story. They're doing a job completely separate and unto itself. Um, a lot of experienced journalists view what they do as vital to democracy. They're, they're not worry, worrying about whether Tom and Un has a story to tell them. Uh, they're, they're doing what's important. And, and I have to look at that. Every story I'm looking at, I have to think about who cares. So it's a mixed agenda yep. in certain respects, right? You've got the message you want to share. They have a higher purpose or something Absolutely. else that they're focused on. Yep. And it's finding the commonality, be, you know, it so that you can create a win-win situation. Yep, and, it, and it's a really, a, they're really out of, the, of everyone's control, and, and rightfully so, I would argue, that that's what they're doing. They're, they're reporting on what's happening, the news as it is of the day, and they're following what those trends are. And your challenge as a, someone who tries trying to tell them the story is actually making it compelling and relevant. Because if it's just you know, uh, your, your world from your point of view, and you can't communicate why it's important to the rest of the world, it doesn't work. Okay, thank you for sharing that. One last question for you before we wrap up for today, and thank you so much for being on the show. If there's something you could do more of, in 30 seconds or less, what would you do? Well, I think everyone would like to have completely unlimited leisure time, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not gonna happen. But, uh, you know, I, I've had such a great run uh, in my, my own career, but also our family's very happy, very successful. They, I mean, we have a lot of fun playing music, that kind of thing, and I still find time for that. So it's one of you those do. things that I, I love to do, I uh, love to mix it up, have a different balance in my life than most people would even try to have. Uh, and I like to be busy on all kinds of fronts. Every day is different for me. And uh, I want to keep it that way. Good. Thank you so much for sharing all of your insights, your perspective, and your experience. And thank you for joining us today. There are many choices in terms of how you could have spent your time, and we're delighted that you decided to watch Authentic You. I'd like to thank the fabulous crew and my producer here on Rogers TV Cable 20, my Authentic You team, who helps me with my hair, Scott Keller, and my makeup, Jen Havenga, custom made jewelry that I have from Distinct Boutique and my set by David Boy's Home Interiors. And I'd also like to thank Elise Bierstock, who's here to help all of our guests with questions that they may have. And uh, I'd like to thank you. Remember, it's always a good day to be your authentic self. I hope you'll join us for our next show. Thanks so much, and we'll see you real soon.